Okay, good evening. Um, it is a great honor to be back at the National Constitution Center. I am Mike Gerhardt. I'm the scholar in residence here at the Con National Constitution Center. And it is always an incredible privilege to be a part of a terrific discussion and terrific town hall program and wonderful opportunity to have a vigorous discussion about significant issues and topics in constitutional law. And tonight, I think we have perhaps the most timely topic of all. Um, uh, I can't wait to hear what we have to say about <laughs> constitutional debates in the Trump era. Uh, we will have to think about that for maybe a nanosecond. Uh, so I want to really just cut right to the chase and introduce our terrific panel. Um, please turn off your cell phones in the meantime um, so I don't get confused as to who's calling whom. Um, but I want to introduce our terrific panelists, and I hope you'll uh, um, be patient while I'm giving you a very short introduction so we can just kind of move right into our discussion as quickly as possible. Uh, at the, my far left is Brianne uh, Garan. She is the uh, Chief Counsel of the Constitutional um, Accountability Center. And before, before taking a role, Brianne served as uh, the center's appellate counsel. Next to her, to her right, is Elizabeth Slattery, who is a legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, where she researches and writes about the rule of law, separation of powers, civil rights, and other constitutional issues. And then to my immediate left is Keith Whittington, who's the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics at Princeton University, a longtime friend of mine and a wonderful, wonderful, thoughtful constitutional commentator. So we're gonna go right to Brianne. And what I'm gonna ask you at the outset is, for this great topic, what do you consider to be the most important or most significant thing to think about with regard to President Trump and the Constitution? Well, you know, I think one thing that we can probably all agree on in the stage is that President Trump has brought renewed attention to constitutional provisions, constitutional principles that weren't the subject of a lot of discussion or debate before his rise to political prominence. And I think a great example of that is the emoluments clauses, these critical anti-corruption provisions in the Constitution. Now, you know, if you didn't know what the emoluments clauses were before 2016, you weren't alone. Um, most people didn't, even most lawyers probably didn't. And that's not because they aren't important. They're incredibly important. They were incredibly important to our nation's framers. But, you know, past presidents, past federal officials did what they needed to do to comply with these provisions. President Trump here, as in so many areas, has charted a very different path. So there are two clauses, the Foreign Emoluments Clause, which provides that no person holding any office of profit or trust under the United States shall accept any emolument, present, office, or title of any kind whatever from any king, prince, or foreign state. And the Domestic Emoluments Clause, which provides that the president and the president alone can't accept any emolument from the federal government other than his fixed compensation for serving as president or from state and local governments. So these provisions are both incredibly important. They're both incredibly relevant in the age of Trump. I'm going to focus just on the Foreign Emoluments Clause because I know there's a lot of stuff, things that we want to talk about this evening. So the framers, when they drafted our National Charter, were deeply, deeply concerned about foreign corruption. They were deeply concerned about foreign influence. They really worried that the leaders of foreign governments might give presents and benefits to our nation's leaders, including our president, in an effort to undermine their loyalty, to encourage them to put their own self-interest above the interest of the American people. And so to address that concern, they adopted the Foreign Emoluments Clause, this really broad, prophylactic safeguard against foreign corruption and foreign influence. You know, they used broad language. They said that it you know, prohibits accepting any emolument, present, officer title, of any kind, whatever. They used the broad term emolument. Now, it's obviously not a term that we use a lot today, but it was commonly used at the framing. And at the framing, it had a very broad meaning, um, you know, any profit or benefit or advantage. And they made the prohibition incredibly absolute, permitting only one exception, which is that federal officials could accept emoluments if they first obtained consent from Congress. And, and this was incredibly important to the framers. You know, they thought that by requiring federal officials, including the president, to first go to Congress to disclose benefits that they wish to accept and to obtain congressional consent before accepting any emoluments or benefits from foreign governments, that that would ensure accountability and transparency that would help address the corruption concerns that gave rise to the clause in the first place. So this was an incredibly important provision. 
Um, President Trump, despite this broad prohibition, has since he took office accepted countless benefits from foreign governments without going to Congress and disclosing those benefits or obtaining congressional consent. You know, I think the things that have gotten the most attention are the foreign governments um, holding events or getting rooms at his hotel in DC. Um, those were totally predictable. As soon as he was elected, there were diplomatic delegations saying, of course we're gonna go to the Trump Hotel. It'd be rude for us not to. This is the way that we you know, curry favor with the president. But there's lots of other examples. There's trademarks from foreign governments. Um, last year, China approved roughly 40 trademarks. A, a Hong Kong IP consultancy, um, an expert there said he'd never seen so many applications approved so expeditiously. There's foreign governments you know, buying properties in Trump buildings. Um, last week, news broke that Qatar bought a $6.5 million apartment in one of Trump's towers in New York. And then, of course, the Trump Organization has properties and developments around the world. And so foreign governments you know, might think that it's in their interest to grease the skids, to make things a little bit easier for these properties, again, as, in, as a way to curry favor with the president. And I think what's critical you know, to keep in mind is that what we know about, what journalists and investigators have unearthed, is likely only the tip of the iceberg. Because the president has been you know, famously not transparent about his business interests, because he hasn't gone to Congress to disclose the benefits that he wants to accept and to obtain congressional consent. There's likely lots of other benefits that he's accepting from foreign governments that we don't know about. And you know, this really matters. Um, it matters for the very reason the framers included the clause in the Constitution in the first place. They wanted to make sure that when federal officials, when the president um, is accepting benefits from foreign, when the president is making you know, critical policy decisions, decisions that often implicate you know, national security concerns, our nation's foreign policy, they wanted to make sure that the only thing that it was, it was influencing his decisions was the best interest of the nation and the American people. And when the president is accepting benefits from foreign governments, you know, it calls all of that into question. So the emoluments clauses, you know, not things that we were talking about before, we didn't need to, I think really critically important and kind of reflective of this president's you know, real disregard for the rule of law and for constitutional norms and values that other presidents have, see, have you know, made sure they complied with. Okay, thank you. And of course, one of our challenges tonight will be to see how many issues we can talk about. Now, you know, somebody's keeping a tally somewhere. Um, I guessed 87, but we'll see how close we get to that. Um, uh, Elizabeth, so what, when we think of President Trump, the Constitution, what is the issue you, or topic you think is the most important to focus on? I think the, the federal judiciary, uh, well, first I just want to say thank you all to coming to, uh, for coming tonight. This is a great opportunity uh, for us to talk about these really big issues. Um, you know, before the nation currently. But I wanted to talk about the, the state of the federal courts because President Trump entered office with an incredible opportunity to, to make a mark on the federal judiciary. So over the course of, if he has two terms, the average president in, in eight years will appoint roughly a third of the federal judiciary. Now, when, when President Obama entered office, uh, just looking at the federal appeals courts, one in nine of those courts had judges who had been appointed by Democratic presidents. And this is kind of a rough proxy. I'm not saying that all of those judges are Democratic judges, but this is kind of a way to identify them. Um, by the time President Trump took office, nine in 13 of the federal appeal, appeals courts had judges who had been appointed by a Democratic president. Uh, so you can see how uh, the courts can shift you know, just in the course of, of two terms. Now, when President Trump entered office, there were over 100 vacancies on the federal courts. Part of this was because President Obama, in the first couple years, didn't make as much of a push to fill many vacancies on the court. And, and there were also some issues with uh, once the, the Republicans took uh, control of the Senate, that they were stopping down, uh, slowing down the, uh, the rate of, of confirmations. Now, since uh, President Trump took office, he's nominated 79 individuals to the federal courts, including uh, our newest justice, Neil Gorsuch, to the Supreme Court, and 33 judges have been confirmed. He had a banner first year in terms of Court of Appeals judges, and to date, 15 have been confirmed in the Senate. Uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has said he's going to, he's hopefully going to have six more judges confirmed in the next few weeks uh, when they come back from recess. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the type of 
of judges that President Trump has been selecting because there has been a lot of howling in the media that you know these are partisan hacks that they are not going to be independent and impartial arbiters of of the law now starting with Justice Gorsuch in his first year of service on the Supreme Court he continued the the record that he had started in, in 10 years on the Court of Appeals showing that he cares deeply about getting the law right that he's very independent and that he he really wants to write clearly and make the law accessible and understandable to average Americans. Now, Justice Gorsuch believes that the judiciary is best when it's restrained. He thinks that judges should uh, it, it turn down invitations to update laws rather than interpret them. Um, and he's very concerned about the, the growth of the modern administrative state. Uh, on this point, he joined with Justice Clarence Thomas in a dissent from a, uh, the court's decision not to take a case that dealt with um, how much deference is given to administrative agencies when they're in court. Now, although Justice Gorsuch has, prime, has been very closely aligned with Justice uh, Clarence Thomas, who is um, most likely the, uh, the most conservative member of the court, there have been some notable times when Gorsuch has broken from his, uh, his fast friendship with Justice Thomas and, and joined the more liberal wing of the bench. Uh, most uh, recently, in, in a case called Sessions versus Di, uh, Di Maia, he joined with the, uh, the Democratic appointees to the court to find a part of the Immigration and Nationality Act unconstitutionally vague. Now, he wrote separately because his concern was that vague laws invite uh, the exercise of arbitrary power and uh, that, that the law must give fair notice to people. Now, uh, I think it's interesting to note that Justice Thomas also dissented in this case, um, and it really shows sort of the, the breadth of diversity among the, the conservative members of the court that you know, they, can, they can agree on so many things and then be so far apart on other things. Uh, but Justice Thomas was concerned about the court striking down laws uh, for vagueness on constitutional grounds, and he thought that dealing with them through statutory construction was a, was a better way to do that. Uh, Thomas and, and Gorsuch also were at loggerheads in a case called Oil States that came out a couple of weeks ago. In this, uh, the court was looking at an administrative uh, review process by the patent and, and uh, the patent and trial uh, patent trial and appeal board, and and when it reviews the validity of a patent that's been granted for inventions, uh, the issue is whether this is a property right that can only be extinguished by an Article III court or whether this administrative process uh, comports with the Constitution. Thomas wrote the majority opinion and he found that um, in his view patents are public rights and so Congress can assign uh, the, the responsibility for reviewing them and potentially canceling them, removing that right um, to, uh, to um, administrative bodies. Um, Gorsuch dissented very passionately, and he said, you know, he thinks that uh, invention patents should be treated like land patents, and these are always adjudicated by Article III judges. And I, I want to um, close with a, a quote that he had at the end, and he said, the loss of the right to an independent judge is never a small thing. It's for that reason Hamilton warned the judiciary to take all possible care to defend itself against intrusions by the other branches. Uh, so this is just sort of a brief survey of Justice Gorsuch and his time on the Supreme Court. Um, but I think it shows that uh, President Trump is, is taking this job seriously in looking for independent and, and uh, impartial individuals when he's placing them on the, on the federal courts. Okay, thank you. And Keith, what do you think is the, the subject or, uh, that's most important to consider when we look at President Trump and the Constitution? Whatever Rudy Giuliani is talking about tonight on, <laughs> on TV. Um, so, so this is a weird administration. It's constantly generating new issues. Uh, some of those issues are very unconventional and surprising and uh, not things that we've thought about um, uh, very deeply in many cases. And some of them are much more um, conventional and familiar um, kinds of constitutional disputes. So let me highlight a couple, uh, one more conventional um, and one a little less conventional. So the conventional um, dispute that's already arisen a little bit with the Trump administration, but I think is strikingly um, less significant in the Trump administration than it's been actually uh, across the Obama administration and the Bush administration um, is war powers. Um, uh, for a while, it looked like, in fact, that we might not have to talk about war powers very much at all um, during the Trump administration. Um, I think the Syria strikes have um, pushed that issue onto the table uh, in an interesting way um, that we ought to pay attention to. Um, as you'd expect, um, uh, issues about presidential power um, uh, to uh, manage troops abroad and to use military force um, abroad have been uh, very much um, on the table and something the administration has thought very hard about, but also um, Congress and the courts have thought 
very hard about um, over the last couple of administrations. Uh, one thing that's striking about the Syria strikes, though, um, uh, unlike um, some of the action taken by the Bush administration um, or the Obama administration, is they're particularly hard to justify uh, under either of the authorization for the use of military force that Congress passed um, either immediately after 9-11 um, that authorized uh, the president to move into Afghanistan um, or the one that immediately preceded uh, the Iraq war. Um, both of those are very flexible. Um, administrations have used them to justify a wide range of actions, um, uh, not only in Iraq and not only in Afghanistan, but also in other countries against um, uh, opponents that were um, uh, not even in play um, at the time. So some of the actions against ISIS, for example, um, have been justified um, under those same authorizations for the use of military force. What's striking about the um, uh, uh, military strike on, on Syria, though, um, is this strikes against against the Syrian government itself, um, not against um, uh, terrorist organizations uh, inside uh, Syrian ter territory, for example, but against a foreign government. Um, and there's no clear authorization for that in either the 9-11 um, uh, authorization to use military force um, or the Iraq war um, authorization to use military force, which puts the administration in a, um, a particularly aggressive posture um, in terms of justifying its actions. Um, in, part, in, in that there, the administration wants to rely solely on Article to um, authority. The administration hasn't um, offered an elaborate um, explanation as to where the legal authority um, for those uh, Syrian strikes com comes from. Um, the few public statements they've offered have suggested the president simply wants to rely um, on his commander-in-chief authority um, uh, built into Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution, which lays out the powers um, of the president itself. So he's not appealing to any uh, particular authorization um, that Congress has provided. Um, and that's a very expansive notion um, of what what um, presidential war powers might be, what kinds of military efforts um, presidents uh, might want to initiate. Um, and once you've opened that door, um, the presidents can attack foreign governments uh, without any form of congressional authorization. Um, when American troops or, or American citizens are not immediately under attack, um, it raises a lot of options um, for presidents. And so I think this is a fairly controversial use the, of military power, um, despite the fact that, pres that President Trump has not uh, 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 been as active um, in launching new uh, military initiatives as the Obama and Bush administration. So relatively conventional kind of concern that we're familiar with uh, recently, although uh, Trump's uh, pushing that concern forward. The more unconventional, um, I think, aspect that I'd at least put on the table uh, relative to Trump is thinking about uh, how Trump might leave office. Um, so uh, uh, I'll, I'll lay aside for now the 25th Amendment, which uh, if we had uh, been uh, meeting a few months ago, maybe that'd be something we'd want to talk about, maybe a little less so now. Um, I think appropriately. Um, but impeachment, obviously, um, is something that's hovered over the Trump administration um, uh, since Inauguration Day. Um, there's been um, lots of activists um, who um, have thought that the Trump administration was um, almost immediately um, engaged in impeachable offenses, some based on the emoluments um, clause and administration efforts there, um, but also um, lots of other actions that um, President Trump um, himself um, has taken uh, since then. There have been Democratic congressmen who've introduced um, articles of impeachment uh, into Congress, and there's been um, one vote um, on the House floor um, on whether or not to um, pursue an impeachment inquiry. Um, those uh, particular articles of impeachment were um, drawn um, somewhat narrowly, focused a lot on um, President Trump's uh, rhetoric and reactions and particular um, after the uh, Charlottesville riots, um, which were positioned um, by um, some Democratic congressmen as uh, particularly um, unbefitting um, a president of the United States um, to engage in. That's also a relatively aggressive um, use um, of the impeachment power to, to do that, although there's some basis for it in thinking about um, how Congress pursued President Andrew Johnson um, uh, during, during Reconstruction. Um, but obviously, um, the sort of, I think, the more uh, salient thing and the thing that's more likely to get a lot of votes in Congress um, if it comes to pass um, is the results of the Mueller investigation and things that might emerge um, out of that. Um, I would expect Democrats down the road will want to test um, uh, uh, what the impeachment power might hold uh, relative to some of those claims, whether it's obstruction of justice kinds of arguments 
documents um, or whether it's um, uh, things relating to how the campaign uh, was run um, uh, and, and the like um, will open the door potentially to think further about sort of what the scope of high crimes and misdemeanors actually is um, in this kind of context. And moreover, we might imagine um, some of these things coming to a head over the Mueller investigation itself. So not only the stuff that Mueller uh, finds potentially and conclusions he reaches, but if the president, for example, were to try to remove um, uh, Mueller either directly or indirectly, uh, whether he um, is subpoenaed um, to provide testimony and refuses to comply with a uh, subpoena, for example, you can imagine those things also raising questions about uh, what the congressional role uh, might be um, to intervene um, at, at that point. Um, so unfortunately, we've talked more about impeachment um, in recent years than I ever would have imagined um, uh, that, uh, that we would, but still I think it should uh, fall in the category of unconventional uh, kinds of constitutional issues to talk about. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we're off and running. Um, uh, Brian, I want to, uh, I know you've also been involved with, uh, first of all, I want all, each of you to feel free to comment or talk about what the others have raised, but one issue I was going to ask you about, Brian, was the travel ban, or what we sometimes uh, conversationally describe as the travel ban, which I think you have been involved with in that, that litigation. Yeah, I mean, I think immigration writ large is an example in which we're seeing this president's willingness to really push the constitutional envelope. And the travel ban, the Muslim ban, is probably just the example that's received the most attention. So, you know, as folks know, when the president came into office, he issued this Trump, he issued this travel Muslim ban. We've seen several, several iterations of it since then. We're now on the third iteration. And in its current iteration, it bars over 150 million individuals virtually all from Muslim majority countries um, from coming into the United States. And you know, this ban, just like the ones that preceded it, is really rife with anti-Muslim animus. It's you know, this president's effort to make good on the promises that he made as a candidate to bar Muslims from coming into the country. And you know, I think there are multiple legal problems with the ban. It violates the immigration laws passed by Congress, but you know, it's relevant to our conversation tonight. It also violates our fundamental commitment to a nation that's free from religious discrimination. Our First Amendment, the Establishment Clause, which guarantees that no one should be just discriminated against, disfavored because of their religion. You know, one thing that I think has gotten less attention in the conversation about the Muslim ban than it should have is the colonial history of actually using immigration restrictions to disfavor religious groups. Um, a number of the colonies had immigration laws um, to keep out members of particular religions that they thought were dangerous, much like you know, President Trump now thinks that we should keep out Muslims. Um, some of these laws were directed against Catholics. Some of these laws were directed against Quakers. And when the framers adopted the First Amendment, they did so to reject exactly this practice, to make clear that no one should be favored or disfavored because of their religion, that our immigration laws shouldn't treat people different because of their religion. Um, Justice Kennedy has said that the central meaning of the religion clauses is, is that all creeds must be tolerated and none favored. And the president's Muslim ban just flunks that test entirely. Um, but that's only, I think, one example of how we're seeing constitutional issues come up in the context of this administration's immigration policies. There's Another example, which is um, the administration's effort to withhold um, anti-crime funding from local jurisdictions if they don't uh, adopt the administration's preferred policies with respect to immigrants. Um, there was a decision a couple of weeks ago in a case called Chicago v. Sessions out of the Seventh Circuit in which the panel uh, unanimously um, affirmed the lower court decision in joining Attorney General Sessions' effort to withhold anti-crime funding from Chicago. Um, they made clear that Congress, in setting up this funding program, didn't allow the Attorney General to impose new conditions. And they made clear that Attorney General Sessions' effort to do so ran afoul of really fundamental separation of powers principles. And you know, spoke very powerfully about the role of the courts as a check on illegal executive action. And I think that's something we've obviously seen across issue areas over the last two years is you know, courts recognizing that it's their responsibility to apply faithfully the laws that Congress has written, to apply the text and history of the Constitution. And when this administration, when the executive branch is taking action that runs afoul of those laws, um, to say so and to prevent the executive from doing it. And there's one more example that I think it's worth just mentioning really quickly. I'm, I'm trying to get you to that 87 that, figure. Right. So that's I'm just right. trying to hit them one after another. <laughs> um, this administration recently announced that it was going to add a citizenship question to the 2020 census. Um, and this is really important. You know, our Constitution, a fundamental premise of our Constitution is that all people um, are supposed to be guaranteed equal representation. 
And to ensure that happens, the Constitution requires that we take an actual enumeration of the people in the country. And that clear, explicit constitutional text imposes on the federal government an obligation to count all people in the country, no matter where they're from, no matter whether they're a citizen or not. This administration's decision to add a question on the short form census that goes to everyone about citizenship is likely going to encourage immigrants, those who live with immigrants, not to respond to the census. I mean, there's ample reason to think that um, former directors of the Census Bureau, appointed by presidents of both parties, have expressed concerns about how the addition of this question could affect responsiveness to the census. The Census Bureau's own data has shown um, real concerns about confidentiality and data sharing, um, particularly in light of all these things I've been talking about with respect to this administration's and its policies with respect to immigrants. And so this decision to add a citizenship question really runs afoul of our constitutional commitment to count all persons. It could have really huge consequences. You know, the, the census is used to apportion representatives. It's used to draw congressional lines. It's used to determine how many electors um, states have. It's used to determine how billions of federal funds are allocated across local communities. And the census is something that's done once every 10 years. There aren't do-overs. And so if we mess this up, if we have an undercount because of the addition of this question, um, we will be left with the consequences of that for at least 10 years, um, if not longer. And so as with the emoluments clauses, as with the travel ban, as with the sanctuary city funding, um, there's new litigation that's been filed to challenge the addition of the citizenship question. So we're going to have um, you know, cases teeing up this question and looking at the question of whether the addition of this, que the addition of this question um, can stand given the consequences constitutional commitment to account of all persons. Okay, thank you. Um, so Elizabeth, you've been placed in the middle. <laughs> um, and you've got a number of issues you can talk about, and I, I don't want to, you can go, go talk about any other subject you wanted to talk about, but I also want to raise a question um, on the topic you initially just talked about yourself, uh, judicial selection. So is there an ideology that in fact is, is shaping the judicial appointments? So, so you. When you talked about transforming the judiciary, you talked about its transformation in terms of, I think, an ideology. If there is such an ideology or ideological um, criteria that are being used for judicial appointments, what are they? Sure, thanks. Um, so I would say that overall, overwhelmingly, the, uh, the individuals that President Trump is, is tapping for these nominations are originalists. They believe that uh, judges should try to understand the original public meaning of the text of the Constitution or the, the language of statutes when they are construing them. Um, and that is uh, to, to seek to prevent the judge from placing their own personal views and policy preferences into the law. Um, I think that's the sort of the or, overarching uh, ideology for uh, for what President Trump is looking for, and for for what he's found in uh, in most of the nominees that he's put forward, and you know many of them uh, uh, in terms of um, their backgrounds, it's a, a very diverse group of individuals coming from some from academia, many from state governments. We, we've seen a number of um, former state solicitors general. These are the the chief lawyers. Uh, uh, you know, uh, who argue in court uh, for, for the states, um, in addition to district court judges who have a wealth of experience. Uh, so I think overall, I've been very pleased with, with the, uh, the individuals that President Trump has been selecting. Okay, thank you. So Keith, of course, one of the themes we've already touched on has to do with the balance of power, or checks and balances. Um, and uh, one thing that seems to be emerging, I think, from the comments is that we're talking about a president who I think is clearly exercising his power, clearly pushing power uh, perhaps to the, to the boundaries or to the extremes. And so I'm curious what you would have to say about what the effects of that would be. In other words, do we see, it may, it, and it's still early, but do we see to some extent the president acquiring more power at this point? Uh, I think it's hard to say the president's acquiring a lot more power. In some ways this president is a strikingly weak president um, in that he's relying on lots of 
uh, formal tools of power in part because he um, does not necessarily have lots of built-in support even within his own party. Um, uh, so a lot of the President Trump's own policy initiatives um, are things that many in the Republican Party don't necessarily support. So the Republican Party in Congress, which um, while they have a congressional majority, has moved forward some of its own priorities um, from a policy perspective, but haven't necessarily moved forward uh, Trump's particular priorities where they might deviate um, from a more traditional uh, set of Republican um, priorities. Trump has sometimes tried to use um, executive power to push more aggressively um, uh, on some of those. So, for example, some of his initial executive orders um, on the travel ban, on uh, uh, going after sanctuary cities, and on immigration were efforts, I think, to um, uh, push harder um, uh, than where uh, Congress uh, would have been. And so he's tried to rely more um, on his own authority. Although even there, he's mostly... Um, uh, trying to leverage uh, fairly uh, loosely written statutory statutes that have empowered the president to exercise lots of discretion um, in these kind of areas. And so part of what he's being called to account for is whether he's actually pushed even further than those congressional statutes would allow. But it's also notable that that opens the door for Congress to come back and push on some of that, uh, right? So if Congress isn't happy with what the president's doing on sanctuary cities, if Congress isn't happy with what the president's doing um, on the travel ban, if Congress isn't happy with what the president's doing on tariffs, for example, um, Congress has its within its own authority um, the ability to shrink some of that statutory discretion, and, and it would have significant consequences um, for the president's um, own authority. Just one last thing to add um, to build on this point about the judiciary. I think it's worth highlighting um, the fact that the Trump administration has been very efficient um, in moving judicial nominees forward to the Senate. Um, but one thing to note about those nominees is that they um, are very much the same kinds of conventional nominees you would expect to get out of most any Republican administration. Um, I don't think for the most part that these nominees are distinctively uh, Trumpist um, with a distinct set of uh, constitutional views um, or inclinations um, that tie them to um, things we might associate with Trump per se, um, as opposed to um, a what we might think of as the conservative wing of the Republican Party uh, more generally that we might have expected to get out of uh, most any Republican presidency um, at, at this point. So, Brianne, I want to pick up where Keith left off. Is, are, is what we're seeing with regard to judicial appointments business as usual, or do you think there's something else happening when it comes to uh, the judicial appointment process? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's quite business as usual. I mean, I want to start by agreeing the uh, judicial appointments and the judicial appointments process is incredibly important. You know, we talk a lot about the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decides, you know, 70 cases a year, give or take, um, often lately less. Um, the courts of appeals decide, you know, roughly 50,000 cases a year, and cases, you know, dealing with every aspect of our daily lives, um, incredibly important decisions about, you know, the quality of the air we breathe and the water we drink, about how our employer treats us, um, about what rights we enjoy under law. So, you know, who is on the federal bench is incredibly important, and, you know, I think it's right, it's obviously early in the Trump administration, but it's possible that his fashioning of the judiciary could be, you know, one of the most significant aspects of his legacy. You know, he'll serve eight years or four years, or as we've discussed, perhaps less. Um, his appointments to the federal bench will be there for life. And he has nominated, um, I think, a record number of very young appointees, of appointees under 45. And he's really set a record pace in the number of court of appeals judges that he's gotten on the bench in his first year plus. And, you know, it's in part because of the number of vacancies that he um, that were on the federal bench when he took office. And that's, you know, I mean, Elizabeth alluded to this, but I think it's, you know, worth emphasizing, um, you know, why are there, were there lots of vacancies? Well, it was in large part because the Republicans in the Senate in the last years of the Obama administration did a really good job of not doing their job. You know, obviously the most significant example of that is um, Chief Judge Garland, who was nominated to the Supreme Court and who was stunningly um, never even given a hearing and a vote on his nomination. And that's what left open the vacancy um, that Justice Neil Gorsuch now fits. Um, they did something um, similar, denying lots of circuit court nominees um, votes as well. And so that left really a record number of vacancies in the Court of Appeals um, that Trump is, with the help of the Republicans in the Senate, um, very efficiently now filling. And I think it's worth you know, underscoring you know, he has a right as president to make his nominations, but it's also the obligation and responsibility of the Senate to carefully consider those nominees. And what we're seeing now is people really being rushed through um, 
in a process that I think does not give these nominees to lifetime appointments the amount of careful consideration that they should be getting. We're seeing um, hearings in which multiple Court of Appeals nominees are all in one hearing, which means that a senator who wants to ask questions has to divide his or her very limited time among multiple nominees. Um, we're seeing an abandonment of the centuries old, what's called the blue slip process. I realize this is very wonky getting into Senate procedure, but you know, normally um, when uh, the president is making judicial nominations, he consults with the home state senators um, for the seat. Um, and if they won't return the blue slips, then those nominees don't go forward. We're seeing an abandonment of that process. Um, and so it's those kinds of departures from the normal process that are contributing to this kind of record um, confirmation of lifetime appointees. And you know, I think that's the process. The substance is also important. I think, you know, Keith is right, certainly, you know, many of the nominees are exactly what we would expect from any Republican nominee, but many of them are not. Um, you know, when you look at the records of some of these nominees, um, you see some pretty stunning things. I mean, there was, there was a judicial nominee who made a comment about transgender children being part of Satan's plan. There was a nominee who, um, you know, had blog posts where he seemed to be supportive of the first KKK. I mean, really um, disturbing comments, which suggests that, you know, a number of not these nominees are not just kind of mainstream Republicans with Republican conservative views, but really um, extreme right-wing nominees. And again, given the importance of the federal judiciary, you know, it's really important that the Senate, the American people have an opportunity to take a really close, hard look at these people's records um, before they enjoy these lifetime appointments where they'll be shaping the law for decades to come. So Elizabeth, I want you to be able to respond to that if you want to. There's uh, a lot but, there. <laughs> but I have a second part to my question. So is, is the, if we assume that there is a, a transformation of the judiciary to some extent, um, is one of the objectives um, to address overregulation? Uh, to what extent do we think that there may be um, a, a problem out there with regard to the federal government's um, extending its regulation too far? And if so, to what extent is the judiciary the answer to that? Yeah, so I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. But uh, I want to address a few things that um, Brianne brought up about the, the pace of nominees uh, going through the Senate and the use of this blue slip rule, which is really getting into the weeds of, of Senate procedure. And, you know, I'm not a Senate procedure nerd, but I can talk about it a little bit. Um, but I'd say overall the process is, is working well. The, the nominees that, uh, that you referenced um, with the sort of right-wing radical views, um, their nominations were, were withdrawn. Uh, and there, there have been others. There was a, a, a nominee for a district court spot, um, and at his confirmation hearing, he got some very tough questions from one of the Republican senators uh, about things uh, that, that would be, um, you know, that he would, legal issues that he had not dealt with before because he was not, he did not have um, a, a long amount of experience as a, a practicing trial lawyer, which is important if you're, if you're going to be placed on a, dis a district court. Um, so, you know, the process is working. The Senate is processing these nominees and has had plenty of time to review their records. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's not unprecedented for multiple appeals court nominees to sit on a panel together for a confirmation hearing. Um, and, you know, it, it's also reflective of the fact that there is an extraordinary number of, of vacancies that President Trump would, would like to fill. Um, it, you know, this certainly could be uh, his, it, it will be his longest lasting legacy, I, I believe. Uh, you know, there are, there are judges who are still on the bench who were appointed by, uh, by Carter, uh, by President Kennedy. So you can see how long that, uh, that a, a judge can, um, can extend a president's legacy. Now, on the, the blue slips thing, which is really getting into the weeds, this is, um, you know, the, a courtesy that the Senate Judiciary Committee affords to the senators from the nominee's home state. So um, I'm from Kentucky. If I were nominated to, if I were so fortunate to be nominated to a federal district courtship in Kentucky, uh, the, the chairman of the committee would send what's called a blue slip to the two home state senators from Kentucky, so Rand Paul and Mitch McConnell. And they would have the opportunity to check a box saying, yes, we approve of Elizabeth Slattery, or no, we have objections to Elizabeth Slattery. It, it's not a, a one or two senator veto. It's to ensure that the home state senators are involved in the process. And you know, part of this is because, particularly for district court nominees, um, 
you, who sit within one state, whereas appeals court nominees cover multiple states. So the, the home state senator rationale is a little, a little less. You know, in the, internet, in, the, in the internet age, obviously we're gonna be able to find all sorts of information about these people. But w when, this, uh, when this policy was first put in place in, I think it was 1917, uh, you know, the president and, and the Senate Judiciary Committee were relying on these home state senators to bring to, uh, to the full Senate's attention if these individuals were really not well suited to be, uh, to be on the judiciary for a lifetime appointment. You know, they, the idea was that the home state senators would have special knowledge because they would be more familiar with them um, in theory. But that doesn't really hold true today in, in the internet age where you can find the you know, anonymous blog posts of, of someone who um, has, been, has been nominated and, and you know, that you know, overwhelmingly these people have um, lengthy paper trails that, that we're able to, uh, to track. But, so I think overall the process has been uh, moving along at a relatively speedy clip, but I, I think that the Senate has had ample opportunity to review these nominees, and I, I hope that they will continue to, to do their, uh, their, their job in, uh, in this process because you know, they, they shouldn't be a rubber stamp for any president, uh, regardless of the nominees. They really should scrutinize all of them and, and confirm those who will be a benefit uh, to, to the federal judiciary. But shifting gears now to overregulation. Um, so I, I think it, it certainly is, uh, overregulation is, is something that uh, a number of, of federal judges are concerned about. Uh, this was something that Justice Gorsuch wrote about when he was on the Tenth Circuit as an appeals court judge. A number of the, the other Supreme Court justices um, have been concerned about the, the growth of the modern administrative state and that we basically have um, all of these agencies that operate as uh, judge, jury, and executioner. And you know, this comes because Congress likes to pass these very vague, broad laws uh, delegating to executive agencies uh, or administrative agencies that are technically housed in the executive branch. And then in turn, the president either uh, is, does not have the ability to fully supervise be, uh, these uh, agencies because uh, sometimes they're given some sort of insulation to protect them from um, firing or removal by the president. Um, but also there are just the, you know, the myriad agencies that it, it would be difficult for him to keep tabs on what all federal bureaucrats are doing. And then then in turn, when you get to the judicial branch, uh, the judiciary has in place all of these doctrines where they defer to uh, administrative agencies on, on the law. So you really don't have anyone keeping as close tabs on, uh, on federal bureaucrats as, as there should be. And it's, it's led to this situation we have where uh, there's uh, Chief Justice John Roberts put it, put it really well. He said, you know, today we have agencies that poke into every nook and cranny of daily life. And I, I submit that they, they should be accountable to the president. I think that's the best way to run them. Um, but that, that is not the way that many administrative agencies are uh, today. OK, thank you. Um, Keith, you had a response? Yeah, I just wanted to note briefly that, that uh, this raises an interesting question about things that are happening during the Trump era but not or not presidential or Trump specific, which is changes in the Senate and how it operates. Um, so across the 20th century, one of the really distinctive things that separated the US House of Representatives from the US Senate um, is the House of Representatives tend to be very majoritarian uh, in its operation. Even narrow ma party majorities uh, in the House were able to get their way um, pretty easily, and they had designed their internal rules um, to allow that to happen. The US Senate, on the other hand, had uh, designed its internal rules, and the Constitution allows both chambers to set their own internal procedures, the U.S. Senate had adopted a set of rules that gave lots of power to the minority um, party in the Senate, even lots of power to individual senators, um, which raised um, a lot of capacity um, to be very obstructionist um, in the Senate and slow things down and make it difficult uh, to move things forward. So one thing we've seen, I think, in our increasingly uh, polarized age um, is a, a, a shrinking tolerance uh, for that kind of obstruction. And so um, across the um, Clinton administration and the Bush administration and the Obama administration, uh, the Senate had become increasingly obstructionist um, in dealing with especially um, circuit court uh, nominees um, uh, to a degree that was relatively unprecedented compared to most of the Senate's history. Um, and first under the Obama administration, now in the Trump administration, there have been moves to take away some of those obstructionist um, vehicles so it's easier for a simple majority um, to uh, confirm uh, judges and put them on the bench. Um, what that leaves open still is the possibility, though, if the majority of the Senate um, changes 
hands, um, a simple majority uh, on the other side uh, might not be so accommodating uh, in um, uh, uh, confirming uh, judges um, onto the bench in the same way that they uh, had been at earlier points in our history. Thank you. Um, we have so many questions, I can't speed read through, through them all quite yet, but they're, they're terrific ones, and I want to come to you, um, Brianne, with the, one of the first ones, because I, I was um, curious to get your take on checks and balances and how well they're working. And we have several questions that go to that, but let me go ahead and ask more directly one of them. Most of the constitutional battles in the Trump era have been fought in the courts and administrative state unelected branches. Uh, this seems to run counter Madison's vision of Congress checking the president, the elected branch, uh, as Parliament checked the crown in England. Why is that? What does it say about our Constitution today that most of the action seems to be occurring in the unelected branches? Well, I mean, obviously, I think part of what we're seeing is, you know, it's exactly right that Congress is supposed to act as a check on the executive. Um, Congress has, if it's willing to use it, lots of oversight tools that are, you know, I think particularly important in this moment where there's lots of questions about um, the ethics and propriety of actions that are being taken, not only by the president, but by members of his administration across, you know, a number of different cabinets, um, a number of different agencies. Um, but, you know, the founders did not account fully for the rise and predominance of political parties. And, you know, the Congress is now controlled by the same party as the president. And I think that is certainly affecting the extent to which, you know, this Congress is really willing to engage in vigorous oversight of um, the executive branch and this administration. But, you know, I, I think it's important to to keep in mind that this, the fact that there is also checking that is happening from the courts is not counter um, the Constitution's kind of fundamental separation of powers values at all. You know, the courts were in fact created um, to be able to serve as a check on illegal executive action. The framers, you know, developed the federal courts. They gave them broad jurisdiction to make sure that they would be a form in which people could go when the executive um, was violating the laws or violating um, the provisions of the Constitution. And so that's exactly what we're seeing now. So, you know, in that sense, I think what we're seeing is the checks and balances um, working quite well. You know, the president is taking lots of different actions. Those actions are being challenged in lots of different courts. And those cases are moving through the court system, you know, exactly as the framers would have contemplated. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Elizabeth, I want to come back to you on a, a couple things. Um, one of them is, uh, I, we have a couple questions from the audience about this. Uh, so, and that is why it makes any sense at all for judges to be, particularly for appellate judges, to be focused on originalism. You know, how, do, how do you square that with the actual duty and function of uh, federal appellate judges? I think, I think it's the most natural way that a judge should approach the law, that they, they try to take the words at face value. They try to understand how the words were understood by the people when they were enacted, either in the constitutional text or in statutory text. Um, and, and this is to try to prevent judges from placing a thumb on the scales, from uh, seeking to put their policy preferences, writing that into the law. And for, in that way, I think it, it makes them uh, more impartial. And uh, you know, I think it's, it's the, the most natural way to, to approach uh, judging at any level. Okay. And, and Keith, um, I know you've written about whether or not it's permissible for a president to be subpoenaed. I want to come back to that um, and maybe link that question up with a, another question relates that, that's being debated a great deal in the media. And it's one that's um, been addressed by constitutional scholars for some time, and that's whether or not it's permissible to indict a sitting president. So I've got two parts. Is it permissible to indict a sitting president? And may, is it permissible to subpoena a president? Right. So. Um, uh, <laughs> Both are contested. Um, I think the Justice Department's current view is that it's not permissible to indict a sitting president. Um, I think that view is, is probably correct. Um, it's, I, and I think that's probably the majority view. I think most um, uh, scholars and lawyers probably um, accept that basic view on the assumption that um, indicting the president, um, uh, a sitting president, um, uh, would place him uh, too much under the control of the judiciary and interfere too much uh, with his constitutional responsibilities. That the appropriate sequence um, ought to be to impeach and remove a president um, and then uh, indict the individual um, after he no longer has those um, constitutional responsibilities um, to implement. Um, I think the question of whether or not it's acceptable to subpoena the president to, um, to testify um, uh, is, is 
I think a difficult one, I think others think it's a, an easier one than I do. So I'm in more of a minority position um, on this point, uh, which is that the court um, during um, the Nixon administration uh, in the Watergate's tapes case came to the conclusion um, against the Nixon administration's claims that it's appropriate to subpoena the president in order to um, get evidence. So documents, tapes, and the like um, that the president had control over, um, it'd be possible for the judiciary to subpoena those documents and require the administration to hand them over. Um, in the Clinton administration, um, there was a further question about whether or not a sitting president could be subjected um, to judicial proceedings uh, more generally. The Clinton administration wanted to put off um, uh, the Paula Jones uh, litigation until after the presidency. And the court concluded then um, that it'd be appropriate to subject the president to some judicial proceedings uh, with a trial court needing to accommodate um, the president's um, particular schedule. I think what, what both those cases still left open is the question of whether or not it's appropriate uh, for the courts to subpoena the president um, to require him to testify. Um, and in that context, it requires um, courts to um, command the president uh, in his person to take up his time, um, to uh, uh, require him um, uh, to comply in a very specific way and not simply hand over documents that are already in his possession, for example, but instead um, uh, set out um, hours and days um, out of his schedule um, to comply uh, with a subpoena um, at, a, at a judicial order. And I think that raises uh, much more difficult um, constitutional questions that really have to be thought of um, separately than these um, earlier cases. I think the court's inclination is going to be to say um, the president should have to comply with those subpoenas because the court in the past um, has been uh, quite bold in its claims uh, relative to its own authority vis-a-vis uh, -vis the president. Um, uh, but I think this one uh, is actually um, stretching it. I think there's also a further concern um, about um, if, if when the courts are dealing directly with the president of this, uh, in this way and issuing uh, directives and commands um, to the president, um, there is a bit of a question of how you actually enforce those commands. Um, and uh, in the case of a subpoena, for example, you could at least imagine a president simply refusing uh, to uh, comply, uh, which puts us in a very difficult um, uh, situation um, at that stage, and I think ultimately be one that Congress would have to resolve um, as to whether or not they're willing to um, step forward with the impeachment power at that stage. Okay, thank you. So, Brianna, I'm actually again going to pick up where Keith has left off, and we're, we're again going to come back and talk about checks and balances, but particularly as they relate to the emoluments clause. Um, so, a couple of the questions from the audience relate to that. Um, one has to do with what, whether or not anybody would have standing to bring a claim with regard to emoluments clause. That's a, an important legal uh, doctrine that you can t you can you're now assigned to discuss for the audience, um, but. But even apart from that, to what extent uh, uh, are uh, checks and balances needed with regard to the enforcement of the emoluments clause? Um, well, so, you know, with respect to standing, and so that's this legal doctrine that says to go into court, you need to have injury in fact. You need to be injured by the action that you're challenging, and it needs to be an injury that the court can redress. Um, and in fact, there are three different suits that have been filed in different courts around the country. There's a suit in New York um, brought by um, Crew, which is a watchdog group, and some competitors of the president's um, hotels and restaurants. There's a suit in Maryland District Court brought by Maryland and DC. And in fact, in that suit, um, the district court judge has already said that he has concluded that Maryland and DC have standing to challenge emoluments with respect to Trump's DC hotel um, because they are injured um, they're, they're comp they're, the, these, ho these states and their um, citizens are competitors with the D.C. hotel, and so to the extent that uh, the D.C. hotel is getting additional business um, because foreign governments are trying to curry favor with the president, um, they are injured and have standing. And there's a third suit um, in the D.C. District Court. My organization, the Constitutional Accountability Center, is actually counsel to roughly 200 members of Congress um, who are suing the president for his violation of the Foreign Emoluments Clause. And our clients have standing because they are assigned in the explicit text of the Constitution um, the right to vote on whether to give their consent or to withhold their consent before the president accepts emoluments. And so there's Supreme Court and D.C. Circuit case law about how when members of Congress votes are nullified, when their votes are disregarded, or they're denied an opportunity to vote to which they're entitled, they have standing to sue in court. And so oral argument in our case um, is gonna be June 7th, so just a month from today. So you know, the answer is that there are people who have standing. I think these cases are gonna get litigated and we're gonna get decisions from the courts on the merits of whether the president is violating um, the Foreign Emoluments Clause. And I think it's critically important um, that the courts do decide you know, this question and the other legal questions that this administration and this president are teeing up 
precisely because it is the responsibility of the courts to say what the law means. It's the responsibility of the courts to serve as a check when the executive is act engaging in illegal action. Um, and so, you know, that's that's why it's so important that all of these issues be go, you know, go to the courts and we get resolution there. Okay, thank you. So, Elizabeth, I want to bring in another issue we haven't touched on yet called freedom of the press. And one of the, one of the arguments and, uh, I guess, charges uh, made to some extent against the president is that he has... Uh, it has to do with his attacks on the press and whether or not those pose any kind of constitutional problem. And particularly, as one question I asked from the audience, is the president's effort to block people on Twitter a First Amendment problem? Coming from a student that's about to graduate law school. <laughs> you know, that, uh, that, that's an open question. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously this is uh, the first president we've had who is uh, vociferously active on Twitter. Twitter active. <laughs> yeah, and you know, uh, the tw you know, things that he had tweeted uh, coming up in, you know, Supreme Court oral arguments in the the travel ban case, it's it's a it's a wild new world. Um, so no, I I'm not sure that the president blocking someone uh, or muting someone because that's another option now on Twitter uh, w would be some sort of a violation of um, of free speech. And in terms of free press, you know, I, I think that uh, the press has uh, has a has a duty to you know carefully scrutinize the president, report on his actions, um, and you know I, I'm not I'm not sure what else I have to add on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Keith, um, I, I want to sort of take us back to some basic notions here that we ha um, that will be important for us. Uh, when we try to understand President Trump and the Constitution, and, and in particular, I'm, talk, I'm thinking about constitutional norms. You know, how are constitutional norms relevant to this, this discussion, and why should they be important? Right. Well, I think in one way, those sort of link up to this question about um, uh, Trump's attacks on the press, right? So um, uh, we generally think about the Constitution as a set of rules, um, and uh, sometimes those are um, what we think of as constitutional law that constrains what government officials can do. It also sets up a set of governmental institutions uh, with certain powers in order to do things. Um, but in the background of both those rules and those institutions um, is a set of sort of operating norms and practices and principles um, that have been gradually built up over time. So they may have um, some connection to the text um, in various ways, but often they are just uh, ways in which uh, political actors have operated. Um, and and those are sometimes guided by a strong sense. Um, sometimes they're just simply guided by a sense of this is the best way of getting things done, right? That it makes the government more efficient. It makes uh, things move forward. Um, it allows us to make policy despite our disagreements. And so there are some uh, ways we ought to operate in order to make it easier um, uh, to make the government machinery um, actually operate. But we might think of some of those sort of norms and practices and assumptions about how um, government officials ought to behave um, are really rooted in a deeper sense of concerns about how do we maintain the kind of free society that we're trying to maintain, how do we maintain a kind of democratic uh, government that we're trying to maintain, and some of these norms may be important um, to uh, supporting that uh, more generally. Um, and one of the things that's striking about sort of an unconventional populist kind of figure like Trump, who also comes from outside of normal politics, is he doesn't care very much about a lot of those standard ways of doing things. Um, he's willing to rip up the playbook um, and proceed differently. Um, and we might think that's really good in some context because we think that, in fact, the playbook um, has led us to problematic policy decisions or um, has led the government to um, uh, not be as efficient and productive as it should be, and so we need somebody um, to come in and shake things up and do things differently. Um, but in other cases, we might be more nervous about um, what the implications are of tearing up the playbook um, and behaving very differently than political actors normally do. Um, so one thing we might be concerned about is sort of this attack on the press. Uh, for example, so if you're constantly talking about how the uh, media is, is the enemy of the people, um, that doesn't violate a constitutional rule as such. I don't think there's good constitutional doctrine um, that would tell us um, that a judge ought to issue an injunction to tell the president, stop tweeting <laughs> um, uh, that the media is the enemy of the people. Um, but nonetheless, we may worry that it is subversive of things we think are very valuable um, about the nature of, of democracy and how it operates, um, such that we prefer a president not do that. Um, 
Um, and we might think similar things about his attack on judges, for example, um, and questions about rule of law. Um, so are there ways of criticizing courts that are appropriate um, and ways of criticizing courts that we might think of as more inappropriate in part because uh, perhaps they're more damaging and subversive um, of a set of norms and practices that um, are valuable um, in, in the long term. Um, so you know, one thing that, that Trump sort of puts on the table um, through his unconventional behavior um, is a question about, well, how much of conventional behavior um, is really important and we want to maintain, and how much of conventional political behavior is in fact dispensable and we could change it and do something very different. So when Trump uh, tweets, um, uh, I'm, I'm modern day presidential, um, uh, we might in some cases think, well, yeah, that's a good idea. That we want somebody to be modern day presidential and do it differently um, than presidents have done it in the past. But on some things, uh, we might think, no, no, there's a reason why we were doing it this way um, and we would prefer um, uh, not to do it in a way that's radically different. Okay, thank you. Now, I, I told each of you at the outset that time is going to fly by really fast, and it has flown by really fast. Um, but I want to go back through one more round, give each of you a chance to talk about what you think is the, the, the takeaway that you'd like the audience to have. But I also want to sort of raise something for you to consider as you talk about what may be the takeaway. Um, this has come through with some of the questions as well. Um, there's a concern that uh, throughout at least part of the country um, that the Constitution may be broken, that to some extent we, we, we may be witnessing before us the fact that things are not quite working as we might have imagined them to work, um, at least pursuant to the Constitution's text and structure. Um, do you think it's broken? Uh, and to what extent might that be a concern that we might address at the end here? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think the Constitution's broken. I mean, what we're seeing is that it is, in fact, robust, and our system of separation of powers is, I think, robust to even um, the most unusual and out-of-the-box president who you know, has shown over the course of his candidacy and his presidency, I think, a real disregard for the rule of law and real contempt for the rule of law. I mean, I think, to, I'll, I'll pick up on you know, what Keith was saying, I think one of the things that has been most distressing um, about the past two years um, is not just the actions the president has taken and his administration has taken, which are unlawful, but I think, as Keith mentioned, you know, his um, real contempt for courts and judges, you know, he, the president has every right to disagree with decisions that judges make, just like President Obama sometimes did before him, just like all of us will sometimes like what courts do and sometimes dislike them. But the ways in which he has talked about judges with which he disagrees, the ways in which his attorney general, I mean, you think about one of the early travel ban decisions, attorney general sessions, um, you know, made some comment about how he couldn't believe that some judge on an island in the Pacific, i.e. a judge on the District Court of Hawaii, um, you know, enjoined the president's order. I mean, that's, I think, not an appropriate way for the court, for the president, for his administration to talk about the courts and the rule of law and, you know, runs a real, that's what kind of creates a real danger of demeaning our institutions and our rule of law. What gives me a lot of hope is that we're seeing courts being robust to that, the courts willing to stand up to this administration um, and to act, you know, when this administration engages in unlawful action. And I think, you know, the real test will be, you know, what happens over the next few years um, and, you know, how the judges that are appointed by President Trump, whether they prove themselves to actually be independent of the president that nominated him. I mean, I think, you know, one thing, um, I, I like judges who apply the text and history of the Constitution as much as Elizabeth does. We probably have very strong disagreements about where the text and history of the Constitution lead. You know, when he was talking about Supreme Court nominations, President Trump, candidate Trump, you know, said he had a number of litmus tests for nominees, that they had to, you know, have certain views on Roe, on guns, that they had to represent well evangelicals. When what I would hope for judges and from the presidents who appoint them is that they would appoint judges who will faithfully apply the text and history and values of the Constitution and of the entire Constitution. And so I think, you know, that's what we really need to, to look at as we look at the years ahead is, you know, do President Trump's judges do that? Do the other judges in the courts do that? Um, you know, particularly in this moment where we have a judge who's really willing to flout um, norms and principles that um, other presidents haven't been willing to flout in the past. So Elizabeth, in wrapping up, um, maybe one thing I'll ask you to consider, if you don't mind, is, um, again, taking off a little bit of what, uh, what Brianne's just said, uh, has to do with the rule of law. How, how robust do you think the rule, rule of law is right now? 
Well, I think just uh, counting up the number of lawsuits that Brian has mentioned, I think the <laughs> rule of law is very robust. I don't think the, the Constitution is is broken. I don't think President Trump has broken our constitutional <laughs> system. And it's been um, it's been really great to see the number of uh, of states, uh, state attorneys general uh, from the Democratic side of the aisle that are really engaged in, in federalism now and that are pushing back on federal power. Uh, I think that's that's something that you know, at the Heritage Foundation, we've advocated for for years. So I'm glad to see that our friends uh, from the left are are starting to see the light on that on that point. Uh, and so I, I hope that at the the end of two years, four years, eight years, however many years President Trump has, hmm. that uh, we we will have a a fully engaged and invigorated society that understands the the promises of the Constitution and and understands uh, the federalism uh, that, that the states share. Um, as well. well, a fully engaged society with the Constitution is exactly what we want here at the National <laughs> Constitution Center. So it looks like we may be headed toward, or towards our objective. Keith, any final thoughts? Here? So I, I guess I would also uh, emphasize that the Constitution is not broken. Um, the Trump administration uh, has not, uh, I think, given us any good cause to think it's broken. I think what we are seeing, though, are some transitions um, in how uh, we operate under the Constitution. Um, so we are seeing, I think, lots of evidence that checks and balances um, work within the system, um, uh, both the judiciary and even Congress, even a Congress controlled by the president's same party, um, have been fairly aggressive at various points um, in pushing back um, against the president. The president's encountered the limits um, of his own authority um, in trying to take action. Um, but we are living in a period in which the parties are increasingly polarized, uh, in which there's a lot of distrust and unhappiness with how um, the government's operating. Um, and I think we are seeing some shifts in how um, the government um, behaves under the U.S. Constitution um, as a consequence of that. So some of what I mentioned before, for example, is how the Senate um, has been modifying some of its own internal procedures um, is a reflection of how we have changed some of what we might think of as our sub-constitutional rules that are nonetheless pretty foundational um, to how the government operates and how we make the constitutional system effective um, and operational. And those have been modified um, and probably will continue to be modified um, in order to try to adjust to the fact that um, we disagree about an awful lot. Um, uh, we have a hard time uh, coming to agreements um, on how to move policy forward. And yet, nonetheless, um, there are things we want um, government to accomplish. Um, and that requires adjusting our conventional ways of doing things in order to um, uh, be responsive, um, have an effective government, um, despite the fact that um, we have lots of disagreements about what exactly we want the government to be doing. Well, I have a feeling each of our guests is going to be talking more and writing more about what we just talked about tonight, and so I hope you will read them. But I want to thank each of you for really helping to realize the dream of the National Constitution Center, which is to have robust civil dialogue about the most important issues in constitutional law. Thank you.